Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> It'll be worth the wait, trust me. Welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. I'm Karen Schofield Leka. My pronouns are per and per, short for person, and I'm the officiant today. Wes is one community unified across time and space, gathering for these Sunday platforms to affirm our values and commit to a better world. So I want to welcome those of you who are here in the hall, those who are watching now on Zoom, and those who will be catching the recording later. If you are on Zoom, please check the chat for a welcome, <clears throat> excuse me, and various tips from Judy Myers, today's Zoom chat usher. And part of the technical problem was her not being able to get in, so bear with her for a moment as she gets settled there, please. Um, if you are here in the hall and would like an assistive listening device, please ask the sound team at the back. Special welcome to our visitors today. We'd love to get to know you and answer any questions you might have. To get on our email list, you can fill out the connection form at tiny.cc slash westconnects or send an email to wes at ethicalsociety.org. And if you're here in person, we invite you to stop by the welcome table that's out in the lobby after platform or just chat with anyone with one of the printed name badges. Folks can share joys, concerns, or sorrows that they would like to let KC, the pastoral care team, and or the community know about. Fill out the blue West Cares form that you find on the welcome table and then simply fold it and either place it in the collection basket or hand it to one of the greeters who will pass it on to KC. And there's also a digital form available at tiny.cc slash westcare. I'm now gonna check the Zoom chat and see who is attending remotely. Let's see who all is here. So people were wondering why they couldn't hear anything. So there's a lot of that, but now hopefully everybody's listening in. Uh, good mornings from Laura DeShula, uh, uh, Hannah and Brennan, Pete, Julie, Donna. Judy Myers is thanking everybody for their patience while we troubleshoot. And everybody seems to be settled in now nicely. So. It is good indeed to be together and share this time. Our opening words this morning are from What's in the Way is the Way, a Practical Guide for Waking Up to Life by Mary O'Malley. Life created the mind as a tool for maneuvering through life, not to be in charge of it. The mind is a wonderful servant, but it is a horrible master. Giving it the task of being in charge of life has created the world of struggle that most people live in all day long, keeping them cut off from peace and joy. Our music today comes from our archives featuring recordings made by the West Chorus. <laughs> Sorrow we must bear, for failures came and lost. 
Each week, we read our statement of purpose as a reminder of our shared values. If you're interested in taking a turn to read the statement of purpose, you can sign up at tiny.cc slash read SOP. You can read it here in person or make a recording that will be included in a future platform. Today's reader is Rajesh Vidyagasar and, nope, I mispronounced that, Vidyasagar. <laughs> Thank you. Who is a fellow officiant and a member of the Leaders Collaborative Advisory Team, or LCAT. Thanks, Karen. The Washington Ethical Society is a humanistic congregation that affirms the worth of every person. We strive through our relationships to elicit the best in the human spirit with faith in human goodness, we appreciate each person's unique capacities. We joyfully celebrate together and support each other through life. We nurture a sense of reverence and responsibility for each other and the earth. We warmly invite you to join our community of children and adults as we work for a world where love and justice cross all borders. As Rajesh lights our community candle, I invite everyone to join in our candle lighting words. May we kindle within us the warmth of compassion, the light of understanding, and the fire of commitment to build a brighter future for all. And Rajesh will now also share a stewardship moment. <laughs> okay. Um, last Sunday, we had uh, the pledge brunch, and it went really well. It was a fabulous day. Uh, I certainly enjoyed myself. But it's at this time that, um, that one thinks about, am I going to pledge? Why am I a member of this community? And what do I get out of it, and what do I give to it? So I, I tend to do this every year. And like most of you, I came to Wes um, as an outsider, looking for something that I hadn't found elsewhere. And I guess uh, I tried a couple of UU organizations and then came here and had my little Goldilocks moment. <laughs> the, the, um, so what have I learned in the, in, the, in the eight years that I've been in West? I actually discovered what male privilege really means for the first time in my life. I had never been aware of it uh, in, a, in a conscious kind of way. Um, and in the platforms, which were always very stimulating, um, I began to learn about male privilege. Um, I also learned a little bit about race. Now I come from India, I'm not immediately conscious of being an outsider in that sense, but having come to this country, I began to learn what it means to be a person of color in this country. Not quite like the African-American experience, but some tinges of it. Uh, I learned what it is to be a member of a community where people share somewhat similar values. So when you get into a, an intellectual engagement with anybody, you're doing it against the backdrop of common shared values, which doesn't often happen. Uh, and that protects you from uh, arid intellectualizing. It, it roots your, your thinking in a way that I had not experienced before. So I retired from my daytime job. I joined because I felt a deep need for a community to, to meet with like-minded people who were sufficiently different from me to be interesting and to whom I would be interesting as well. And I also discovered what it means to become, as an, not as an outsider, but to become increasingly an insider by engaging. And I engaged in different ways, which I won't go into, it's not necessary, but I also resisted 
engagement where this was important. Now, in a moment of, um, of somewhat uh, unwise uh, uh, and poor judgment, Karen actually said to me one day, why don't you try out for the chorus? And I said, okay, that's one I need to avoid. <laughs> because the chorus will probably shut down if I join. <laughs> but but as, I, as I engaged at, at broader levels, like uh, doing the, the, um, the platform support as an officiant, or at the smaller, more intimate level, like in the Thai groups, uh, I found an opportunity to get to know these wonderful people here who've, uh, who are now members of my chosen um, family. And uh, it's, it's been a terrific experience. Now, there's something that I've forgotten to say, and I'm not quite sure what that is. Please pledge. Please pledge. Please pledge. Thanks. Thanks very much. I will point out that Rajesh has exercised uh, a, a, a practice here at West, which is the absolute right to say no, which hopefully allows you the space and the freedom to say yes when things speak to you. So you're encouraged to say no and yes as often as you can here in our community, whether you're a member or a visitor. So thank you very much. Let us enter now into the centering time of our platform. Each week, we ring this chime in solidarity with people around the world. And today, I'm particularly mindful of the arrival of spring, though it's still a little chilly here, and the many ways that is celebrated around the world in the Northern Hemisphere right now. May the balance of the equinox and the rebirth of nature bring us renewal and joy and deepen our commitment to protecting our planet. As we listen to the chime, let us remember our connection to each other and the world around us. Let us open our hearts to compassion for those who suffer. And let us commit ourselves to the work that calls for our love. French philosopher Simone Weil observed that Every time that we really concentrate our attention, we destroy the evil in ourselves. If we concentrate this attention, a quarter of an hour of attention is better than a great many good works. So we won't spend a quarter of an hour right now, but let's take a few minutes for a guided meditation. I invite you to shift your body around until it's in a spot that is comfortable and you can be at ease as much as your body may allow, and breathe. Deep breaths in and out. In and out. And just breathe easily. Locke Kelly explains in Shift into Freedom the science and practice of open-hearted awareness. One of the most important things to learn is how to separate awareness from thinking. And then we can see that thoughts and emotions are not the center of who we are. So what happens when you sit quietly in a room and think about yourself?
What stories does your mind tell you about yourself? Do the words meet Socrates' criteria? Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Do the voices you hear center and balance you or leave you off balance, pulled off center? How might you coax your inner critic to be an advocate instead? We continue our meditation in silence and in the music that follows. Give me birds at the dawning, birds at the dawning, birds at the dawning to sing my soul away. Give me roses at sunrise, roses at sunrise, roses at sunrise to sing. at midday, breezes at midday to sing my soul away. Give me rainbows at tea time, rainbows at tea time, rainbows at tea time to sing my soul away. Give me flames in the sun Flames in the sunset, flames in the sunset to sing my soul away. Give me candles at twilight, candles at twilight, candles at twilight to sing my soul away. Give me love. Today's reading is from English psychoanalytical writer Adam Phillips in his essay Against Self-Criticism, found in his collection Unforbidden Pleasures, where he explores how our inner critic enslaves us. This self-critical part of ourselves is strikingly unimaginative, 
a relentless complainer whose repertoire of tirades is so redundant as to become, to any objective observer, risible and tragic at the same time. Were we, were we to meet this figure socially, as it were, this accusatory character, this internal critic, we would think there was something wrong with him. He would just be boring and cruel. We might think that something terrible had happened to him, that he was living in the aftermath and the fallout of some catastrophe. And we would be right. Or put somewhat more prosaically by Dan Harris, it was in this moment, lying in bed late at night, that I first realized that the voice in my head, the running commentary that had dominated my field of consciousness since I could remember, was kind of an asshole. Our platform speaker today is West Senior Leader Casey Slack, joined by West member Perry Bider. They will be presenting Retiring Our Inner Demons on Personal Growth and Learning to Let Our Internal Defensives Take a Rest. Thank you, Karen. We've been talking this month about chrysalis, about growth and change and letting yourself be in a space where you can, in fact, change. And uh, that inner critic certainly can get in the way. I'm going to talk a little more later about some of my experiences and thoughts I have about how we can help ourselves and to set down the inner critic. But I want to tell you a little bit of background first. So I had talked some number of weeks ago about that we might consider using some of our time together as sort of a personal growth show and tell. So this is sort of an experiment in beginning some personal growth show and tell experiences. Perry was a wonderful first option for this in part because some of the idea was his. And in part because he and I have been in quite a bit of conversation about the inner critic for a while. Some months ago, in an email thread, I shared with Perry a longtime favorite YouTube video of mine. It's from hip hop DJ and cultural commenter Jay Smooth, who also happens to be a graduate of the Ethical Culture Feldston School in New York City. Jay Smooth talks about his inner critic as his little hater the voice in his head that will not let him have done anything well. As a man who at the time was making about one YouTube video per week, which is a lot of work, he was faced constantly with two inner critic voices, that little hater speaking in two turns. One says, you're not being honest. You're being too pithy. You're not a smart person. The other, man, you are so boring. You're so busy getting your little points off that none of this is interesting. You're not an interesting person. This video is a favorite of mine because it reminds me that the people I look up to have some of the same issues that I have. Feeling stuck in between telling the truth and doing something interesting, doing something interesting and doing it as truthfully as possible trying to be a real big nerd with a little bit of swag, complicated. I shared it with Perry, and Perry's response was something like, wow, I hope he's gotten to set that down by now. I really don't know. Jay doesn't have as much of a public persona as he did mm, 10 to 12 years ago when he made that video. He quit his job at the radio station when they hired someone with known sexual assault accusations, actually convictions in the past, sticking to his own ethical beliefs that to work for a company that would choose to hire someone, to put in a position of power someone who they knew had that kind of history with no repentance. He gave up a pretty big platform 
for his values, and I still value what he has to say, but he has it to say less publicly these days. So I've been thinking about my little hater, and how loud my little hater was when I was younger, and how much quieter they are these days. And well, Perry has a story to share with us, something he's prepared that I think gets us to learn a little bit about what people's little haters can sound like, where they come from, and what you might be able to do about it. So come on up, Perry. Thank you, Casey. Good morning. So I'm here to tell you about three insights I had about myself last summer. The first one feels pretty specific to my own life, but I hope the other two will resonate with some of you as well. Before I get to those insights, though, Casey's asked me to share a bit about the process that led me to them. I suspect that if each of you was to make a list of West members who were likely candidates for violating federal and state law by possessing and using a Schedule I controlled substance, I would be pretty far down the list. But I confess, I did in fact take 2.75 grams of magic mushrooms last August. Now it's true that the original seed of the idea for me to do a psilocybin journey was planted almost 40 years ago when I read issue 43 of the Swamp Thing comic book series. So maybe that helps explain things. Turns out Frederick Wortham was right. Comics really are the seduction of the innocent. But OK, let me back up. For years, I have envied the many people around the world, one of them being my wife, Alita, who share a religious or spiritual belief in some kind of underlying, unifying benevolence in the cosmos. Call it a loving God or universal consciousness or whatever other name. My own view has been more mechanistic, that the universe is fundamentally indifferent to our notions of good and evil, that there's no ethical manifold other than what we create through our own actions. It turns out that that worldview has really deep roots in my lived experience going back to the very first days of my life. Some of you know that I'm an adoptee and that before I was adopted at about six months old and before I was placed temporarily with a foster family, I spent my first four weeks in the hospital. I don't know whether that was because they needed to run tests related to the fact that I was born without a right eye or just because that birth defect made it harder to place me with a foster family. In either case, though, evidently neonatal care in that hospital back in 1957 was not as attentive as one might have wished. Decades later, when Alita asked my mom what I was like as an infant, and my mom said, oh, he was such a good baby, he never cried. Alita was horrified because she realized that a baby who never cries is a baby who has learned that crying doesn't do any good. So that was the beginning of my subconscious belief that people can't be relied on, that love can be withdrawn, that the world, and by extension the universe, is not a warm, welcoming place. That belief found plenty of additional support over the years. As a child, when our family's stoic model of everyone has something to live with precluded any exploration of feelings I might have had about my being adopted. In junior high, when one of my closest friends died of cancer, on winter break during my freshman year of college, when I discovered that the girlfriend I had connected with just the week before starting school was leaving me for another best friend. And the next year when she came to the same school I was at and ended up leaving the best friend and moving in with one of my sweet mates, whom she ultimately married. 
Now, to be clear, I am not saying that I've had a particularly high level of disappointment in my life overall. I think the opposite's probably true. But because of my specific circumstances, I believe I am particularly sensitive to feeling disappointed, feeling abandoned when someone leaves my life. So you can see why I've envied people who have a different worldview, who don't get thrown as hard when someone dies or leaves or disappoints them because they have the reassurance that God loves us all or we're all part of a cosmic consciousness or something along those lines. Two things happened in 2022 that got me thinking that maybe I didn't have to just envy those people, maybe I could join them. One was that Alita started reading a book by Michael Pollan called How to Change Your Mind, and then we watched his four-part Netflix documentary series of the same name. The four episodes focused on LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, also known as ecstasy, and mescaline, each one looking at its history, how it came to be criminalized, and how researchers are investigating its potential in therapeutic treatment or spiritual growth. And between Alita starting the book and us watching the series, we happened to visit my multi-talented and extremely impressive niece, Rachel, who turned out to be gung-ho on psilocybin, having taken it multiple times herself. And oh yeah, all this reminded me of that 1985 Swamp Thing comic book, in which a young woman who's about to die of cancer takes a bite of a tuber that had fallen from the Swamp Thing's body and gets a sense of the world as he sees it, as a unified cycle of life in which individual beings come and go, but from which nothing is ever truly lost. As a result, she's able to let go of her fear and dies at peace. Thanks to Michael Pollan and Rachel, it finally dawned on me that that story was probably a reflection of the writer's own experience with actual psychedelic drugs, uh, which made for another bit of encouragement to me. That brings us to 2023, when I found an experienced facilitator slash guide to work with, uh, bought some mushrooms here in the district, it's not against the local law here, and had a psilocybin journey. There isn't time for me to go into chapter and verse now on the experience, so let me jump straight to the key question. Did I have the hoped for encounter with some transcendent universal consciousness or spirit of love? The answer is, maybe? What I had wasn't clear enough or powerful enough to make me a believer, but I came away more open to the possibility that such a thing might exist and more comfortable thinking that I could be okay whether it did or not. If that was the end of the story, I wouldn't be up here today. The insights I want to share with you actually came into focus two weeks later during the integration session with the woman who facilitated my journey. Honestly, I don't know how much the mushrooms had to do with it. Maybe they helped open me up, or maybe she was just the right therapist, that's her day job, asking the right questions at the right time in my life. In any case, as we talked about my fears that people and love can't be depended on, I realized that I have tended to live my life keeping people at arm's length as if there was an inner sentry or guard dog in my head. That was the first insight. The second one was that I had created that sentry, that guard dog, and for a very good reason, to protect myself. I had been badly wounded in infancy by abandonment and neglect so I created the guard dog to make sure that people didn't get close enough to wound me like that again. That led to the third and final insight, that the guard dog had outlived its purpose so I could let him retire. I'm an adult now. I have love in my life. I have friends I can rely on. I have this community, and when loss does occur as it inevitably will, it won't threaten my survival as it did as an infant. 
So I don't need the dog's protection anymore. And I can say to him, thou good and faithful servant, thank you for your years of devotion. You can rest now. Your work is done. So what's different in my life now that I've had those insights? Well, for one thing, I'm up here telling you all this. Uh, I shared some of my origin story here years ago in a response period comment in a platform about trust. But this feels like a new level of openness and vulnerability for me. And I think I'm now more open to the possibility of searching for birth relatives. It's still not a high priority for me, and I seem to have enough on my plate these days. But I think I'm less worried about the possibility of being disappointed by finding people who didn't want to be found or who aren't a good fit for me. Now, finally, I will get to the point of how I think this might apply to someone not named Perry Biter. I have to acknowledge right now that as inner voices go, I think I got off pretty easy with my sentry or guard dog. At least it was saying negative things about the world, not so much directly about me. Some of us don't have inner guard dogs. We have inner critics or drill sergeants or mean teachers telling us we're not good enough, we can never be good enough. And some of us have inner racists or sexists or homophobes or transphobes telling us we're wrong just because of who we are. But my theory, and it is just a theory because I certainly can't speak from experience, is that it's possible to view even those more abusive voices, not as internalized oppressors that need to be overcome and fought, but as outmoded allies who can be thanked and allowed to retire. My theory, or maybe it's just a hope, is that even those voices are parts of ourselves that we created for our own protection because beating ourselves up first was less dangerous than waiting for the big scary adults to do it. If that idea makes sense to you and you've got an inner voice that you'd like to be rid of, you might try talking to it and saying something like, I understand why you are this way and I appreciate what you've tried to do for me all these years. Thank you for the help I needed when I was younger. I don't need that help now, so you are free to rest. If you want to go all out, you could even try throwing your voice a retirement party. In your head or in real life. Or not, it's just an idea. In any case, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Perry. So we all have some sort of internal monologue, some sort of something that goes on inside our brains. And I would imagine I would imagine. I would imagine. I would imagine. There we go. I would imagine that for many of us that voice gets pretty negative, or at least has at some point in our lives. My little hater, as I have decided to call it, cribbing from Jay Smooth, has been really loud over the course of my life for a bunch of reasons that we don't have to get the whole way into right now. But one of them being that uh, as a twice exceptional, which is to say gifted and also a slightly disabled person, someone who was always in the honors classes and could never do homework. Someone who every C I got in high school was because I didn't think the teacher was smarter than me. And I couldn't do the work if I didn't think the teacher was smarter than me, couldn't find a way around it. Someone who didn't have to learn how to study to be in the top of my class in high school despite those Cs. Who got to college and suddenly couldn't do it. I almost failed out of college several times. 
And one particular class I had to take three times in order to manage to pass it. Now, when I managed to pass it, I got an A. But, long story short, don't do your political science degree in reverse. I had started school as a pre-med biochemistry major, thinking since I was three that I wanted to be a doctor. I got to college, I realized that, oh no, I did not want to be a doctor, but I had never thought about doing anything that wasn't science. And so I stayed a biochemistry major, intending to do biochemical research. I knew some people who worked on HIV and AIDS in the biochemistry field, and that was always something I was very passionate about. And then OCHEM happened. And I, listen, freshman year chemistry had been really hard for me too because what everybody else got as a week of review was one class of review for me. Because in addition to not having had to learn how to study in high school, I had gone to a pretty bad school in high school. And then I went to Case Western Reserve University, which is one of those things Perry and I have in common. Um, and I don't know what you know about Case Western, but pre-med at Case Western is meant to get you out of it. Biochemistry at Case Western is meant to get you out of it. It's not really a blaming them thing. It did get me out of it, because as it turns out, I had no business there. I remember very clearly trying to study with two friends of mine who are now plastics engineers. And they said, well, you just pick the molecule up in your head and turn it around. And I said, I do not. I absolutely do not do that. Uh, but if I need to write a paper, I can pretty much just do that. So I wandered around in majors for a while and wound up a political science major, which I did in reverse. I started in actually a 400 level class. I don't know why anyone let me do that. Um, and by the time I was a junior, I was finally taking the intro level classes. This is the wrong time to take intro level classes. And also, intro level classes are hard for me in a way that upper level classes never are. So I took comparative politics three times because I couldn't make myself write a paper I didn't think was interesting. I didn't think I had anything new to say about comparative politics, so I couldn't say anything. It took one of the most like grizzled and direct professors in the department to sit down and look at me and say, you think we're asking undergrad freshmen to have interesting ideas? <laughs> oh, just write a paper and turn it in. I was so mad at myself. I was so mad at myself, but I did it. And when I finally came to write my senior thesis paper, my undergrad advisor, said, if you need to sit down across from me and write it, it took me two years to write my senior thesis, it's not supposed to take two years. Um, if you need to sit down across from me and write it, we'll do that, you need to get out of here. It had been five years. And I did it. And then I graduated and I did not celebrate it at all. I didn't go to the graduation, there was no real party. My parents barely told anyone about it because it took me five years and I had skipped a grade when I was in, I never was in fifth grade. And I was, you know, I was the star child and suddenly I was not the star child. I did not graduate from college and immediately get a high paying job. In fact, it took me many years <laughs> to get anywhere close to the kind of money my parents wanted me to make right out of college. And I hated myself for it. I was so mad at myself, graduated from college in 2010, so mad at myself that when my grandmother died on actually this day in 2011, when I went to her funeral, I was sobbing and I couldn't stop saying that I had failed her because she had died before I had become someone worth being proud of. What a thing to say to yourself. And a friend of mine looked at me, hugged me, and he said, Casey, tell a better story. I was a little put off by that at the moment. I was wallowing. Excuse me, here I am wallowing in the funeral home. But he was 
right. I was really inside this story where I had been a great kid and then failed. This story is really, really easy to understand. Uh, if you maybe ask Caitlin about what the films of me as a baby are like, as I have woken up to my mother showing them to Caitlin before. My mom will say that it was like she had never seen a baby before. There are hours and hours of footage of me just laying there and her being in awe that I exist. I taught my cousins a song that taught them the continents when I was three and they were six and seven. I was an intolerable nerd of a child and I am an intolerable nerd of an adult. But that in-between part, ooh, that was hard. It was hard to figure out how to be a person in the world and a person having thoughts. It was hard because what I was thinking was never what other people were thinking. I would like you to imagine the face of one of my political science advisors, a woman named Karen Beckwith, who was one of the founders of the Women in Politics Journal. When I came to her and I said, I wanna do my senior thesis on either sex work policy or the regulation of sex toys. She said, Casey, what? I think you can do the sex work thing, but what, do you, what are you even thinking about? Because that is not what anybody was trying to study in my department. There was no expert on sex work policy in the political science department at Case Western. Healthcare policy, absolutely. There were a lot of experts on international relations. Shock. And here I was, trying to do a project about something they didn't even really want to talk about. So my grandma dies, and then about five months later, I get this job at the abortion clinic. And I am gonna be a patient advocate, and I'm, I'm really excited. This is something I care about a lot. I am terrified that I'm not gonna be any good at it, because I am convinced that I'm not really any good at anything at this point in my life. And as it happens, no, I am very good at it. I am quickly very, very good at that thing. It is actually, for the first time in years, the first thing that I am naturally pretty good at. And it still takes months to be allowed to see a patient on my own, and I am struggling with the fact that anybody gets to do it before I do, because in my mind, everything is a competition. And it's a competition that I have to win. In doing that, I learn a set of really useful skills. I develop some reflexes, actually. Reflexes that cause me to do things like when the cat meows at me, say, well, what's going on for you right now? Those are actually really good reflexes to have. Because if someone else is behaving strangely in front of you, hey, what's going on for you right now? If you're behaving strangely, hey, what's going on for me right now? And I was able to take those things that I had learned and the way that being in the community of my coworkers at that job made me feel like someone who was not only good at something, but valuable outside of being good at something. My coworkers cared about me just because I was there. It was a remarkable experience. And in that context where my coworkers cared about me and gassed me up when I was in a good outfit, I did not know how to dress myself then. And I was like trying on things, trying on ways I might look. And when it, when it hit, I would go in and think, oh, you look so good, girl. It was great. Everyone needs that experience. And on Sundays and throughout the week, I was doing volunteer work in the congregation I had joined. And I was finding that if I got up and spoke, people were interested in what I had to say, and that I could connect with people who weren't like me or who didn't look on the surface like me and learn and grow so much. And it was out of that context that I was able, able to apply to seminary, to not get into Harvard Divinity School and actually not feel that bad about it in part because I could go upstairs and one of the receptionists immediately said, that's their loss. They're gonna find out. So 
So I applied to seminary. I went to seminary. Before I went to seminary, my grandfather died. And when he died, I did not experience the same breakdown of being not worth being proud of yet. In ways, his death felt like him saying, go, do not stay here and wait for me. Go live your life, learn these things. So I learned these things and I do a year of a clinical pastoral education residency, which is being a hospital chaplain. And I learned even more how to respond to other people's stuff with grace, because listen, people are mad at you when you work in an abortion clinic. The people outside, the people who are there, nobody likes that experience, not a fun time. But if you are me, and you have bright blue hair and some visible tattoos, and you show up in somebody's Catholic hospital, hospital room, and you say, hey, I'm the chaplain, some number of times people will say, you're the devil, get out, okay. Well, that sounds really hard for you. Let me know if you need anything, goodbye. <laughs> More often than that though, was this experience of someone being so deep inside their own stuff that I could have been anyone. What I looked like didn't matter. What I said almost didn't matter. They needed to say some things that were really hard to hear. Things that were critical of themselves, often, very critical of themselves. People who are very ill are often very upset with themselves. Like if illness is something you do to yourself, illness is not something you do to yourself. Very angry at the hospital because their illness was something that couldn't be treated or sometimes something that was not being well treated. Very angry at me for existing uh, as myself, but also as someone in their room asking a question with no clear answer, right? I always think of that as like the gift of the chaplain. You go in and you are the only person in the hospital who doesn't have a checklist you have to fill out. You're the only person who gets to say, I could sit here for an hour. But for some people, someone comes into your room and you want them to check off their list and leave. And if someone continues to say, well, can you tell me how that feels? Oh, well, how do you understand God? Oh, well, okay, what do you do to make meaning out of your life? This is not always the question people want to be asked when they are ill, though they often need to hear it. I developed some really strong reflexes in my pastoral care residency. Strong reflexes that were incredibly useful when in July of that year, my life fell apart. One of the problems with being non-monogamous is that sometimes you get broken up with twice in a month. That is a horrible experience. So it's July, my residency is about to end. At the beginning of the month, one relationship ends. At the end of the month, another relationship ends. At the beginning of August, a job I had been promised does not appear. So now I am barreling into the fall. It is hot as all get out in Los Angeles. I have no job and no partners who are local. I am alone in a way that I had not been in years. And it would have been really easy for me to just be mad at myself. Right? That could feel like a situation that I got myself into. In fact, I did feel for a moment like it was a situation I got myself into. It is a little bit a situation I got myself into because one of these pieces of being able to change is not getting yourself so stuck in an idea of who you are and who you're gonna be that when that doesn't happen, you can't move. So I had entered these relationships that I was in as someone who really, really thought of myself as a girl. And I came out as non-binary before I started my residency and I started using they, them pronouns full time while I was in my residency and my relationships felt this strain because I had entered them in girl mode and was now trying to live differently. And though my partners were both queer and it didn't matter to them, I couldn't get out of what I thought a relationship was like, which was really heavily gendered. Even though I didn't believe in that, even though I have never believed in that, it just was in there. 
So I took a month, and I made sure that in that month, I didn't do anything that wasn't good for me. I didn't drink at all, I didn't smoke any weed. I lived in Los Angeles. These were very normal parts of life. I took myself to the beach a lot. I let my mind respond with what I have learned to call my inner chaplain, rather than the little hater. When the feelings bubbled up and I had to like scream or cry, I did that. I screamed into a lot of pillows that month. At work, they let me erase the month of July off the big whiteboard. I said, this is really important to me. I have to get rid of July. At home, our calendar read F-U-C-K, July, because I needed, to, I needed to get it out somewhere. I took a lot of pictures of myself on the beach because that's a place where I feel alive and whole. In my off time, I put on a lot of like intense, weird makeup because that's a way for me to say, here's who I am. This is me. And I got to get through that change without hating myself. I hated the situation. I hated the situation real bad. But I got to get through that change without hating myself, without hating the person who had promised me a job that he did not know he couldn't promise without hating either of my exes, who are now my partners again. Um, these things happen. Without getting something mean stuck in me. I was in the perfect situation to have my heart broken because I was ready to use all the things that I had learned to make myself bigger instead of smaller to let my heart break and get filled in with love and the idea that it's not over till it's over. That I am a story that I am telling to myself and the world and it won't be done being told until hopefully well after I'm dead. Later, when I took psychedelic mushrooms for the first time, I realized that the mind chaplain was really helpful in that too. Because when I got scared, my brain immediately said, hey, this is a lot, but you're okay. Now, you can get to all of that, that ability to say, hey, you're okay, to say, hey, what's going on for me right now? Without any kind of drugs without year-long chaplain residencies. You do not have to do any of the intense stuff that I have done. You can just practice. One of the best things that I ever did for myself was tape something to my mirror that said, you are not your mistakes. So my suggestion, challenge, encouragement for you for this week, maybe for the next month, Maybe celebrate my birthday in April with me by writing a nice little note to yourself. It doesn't have to be long. You are not your mistakes. This isn't the end. Something else can always happen. You matter. You are loved. There is something worth fighting for. Stick it somewhere where you will see it at least most days. I like a mirror, but maybe for you on your coffee pot is a good place for it. Maybe in your car or where you keep your keys. Find somewhere and remind yourself that you are special. Not better than anyone, not worse than anyone, but exactly the only you that has ever or will ever exist. Remind yourself that you matter enough to check in with your feelings, to get to feel safe and comfortable in your body. And if you need any more reason for why Sorry.
this is the time when we add our own voices to the morning, sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates with our personal experience. For our online participants, I invite you to share in the Zoom chat or in the comments if you're watching the recording later. If you're here in person, we are experimenting with some new methods. So first, a great thing about platform is the many thoughts and feelings it can stimulate. However, the response period isn't sufficient time to delve into all of that. So we encourage folks to gather after platform up here in the front in what we'll call the conversation corner so that you can share your reactions at greater length in discussion with others. And in that case, no need to share during response period. For those with a brief one to two minute response, please raise your hand and I will bring the microphone to you, a practice that might be familiar to those who attended before the pandemic. So we're gonna start out by checking to see if online participants have had a chance to share. So let me check the chat. Uh, good morning, good list a lot of good morning. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, sorry, catching up. Uh, so Lord Shulo says, wow, I love that Goldilocks moment. I think that was Wes for me after trying a UU church that was a little too woo for me and a humanist discussion group that wasn't really anything more than an intellectual TED-like talk plus discussion group. And Judy Myers just right and concurs. Uh, so thanks to Rajesh for mentioning that. Back to the chat. Uh, Lord Shulo again, responding to platform, says, I wrote down a phrase I want to remember from each speaker. Outmoded allies from Perry. And hey, what's going on for you right now from KC? Thank you both. But I think I definitely need to work on my inner critic, as evidenced by the fact that when KC said, you are not your mistakes, my immediate thought was, then who is? <laughs> So that's what's in the chat right now. Folks can continue to add to the chat. We'll check back on that in a bit. But right now, we are gonna go ahead and have our response period. Uh, give me just a moment. Raise your hand. Um, I will bring the microphone to you, and I encourage you again to kind of distill your thought and give space for a moment for those who are introverted or maybe you'll need a little bit of quiet time to process to take a moment to do that. And then I will come around. If you wanna go ahead and raise your hand, I'll bring the mic to you. Please begin by saying your name and pronouns. And be sure to keep your comments brief, perhaps no more than a minute or two, so others have a chance to share. Uh, Jeff, me, all, he, him, his. Wow, this is like the old days. Um, I wanted to address two things. Uh, first to Perry, because you and I have similar very early life situations. Uh, I was born uh, seven weeks premature. Um, and in 1958, the idea, the, the way that, that you would be treated if you were in that situation so you'd be locked in an incubator. It was like a neonatal form of solitary confinement. And you're let out one hour a day so your mom could hold you. And you weren't allowed to breastfeed. You had to, you, you know, you didn't get the stuff on tap. You had to settle for the bottle. Um, and I wonder if that contributed to a sense of aloneness and isolation that no one can possibly care for you. and. You're, you're never, ever, ever going to feel like anybody else. And the other comment I'd like to make to KC, because I understand about the idea of the failed 
I wouldn't say failed potential, but that's what it feels like. That, you know, you excel in high school and then you get to college and you cue the sound of the needle being moved across the phonograph. Right? Um, it was difficult. And I guess because also of the um, being born prematurely, I didn't learn to speak until I was like three years old. And I was a hit in the neighborhood because, you know, the really big kids, the ones who were six and seven, they called me the pointer because they would say, Jeff, see that dog? And I would go, see the, see the car on the street? You know, when you're two years old and you're hanging out with six and seven year olds, that's the big time. I mean, you, that's the, you know, we hit the heights. Um, and to solve that, my uh, parents found a therapist in New York City. And once a week or so, my mom would take me and my baby sister, and we'd catch the Long Island Railroad at Massapequa Park for the train ride into New York City. I wonder what that could have led to. First, Casey, I really resonate with the chemistry story. Shirley Storms, <laughs> she, her. Um, the program I was in for elementary school teachers, they had a, a short science, and we had six, a six-week chemistry class. My husband was actually in it with me. We got married after our sophomore year. So we went to the class. The teacher said, this is going to be really easy for you. I'm just going to take your high school text, and we're going to go through it, and it'll be a breeze. Well, I had never taken chemistry. So when you were doing a chapter a day, I was just like, what? <laughs> and my husband loved chemistry. He tried to help me, but it was just, I was just hopeless. And the professor, I, I got a D in the class, which was fine with me. I was very happy with the D. He said, yeah, it was the lowest D I ever gave. <laughs> I was like, oh. And after a story about my husband, after he got his PhD, we were living in Illinois, and he was teaching political science, and he loved teaching, but he did not want to publish. He didn't think he had anything to say. He thought most of what people published was asinine and, you know, just whatever. Um, so he really resisted it until his job was at risk. So he was offered the opportunity to, which he tried to get out of, to come here for a year for a fellowship. Now, that'll be something you could put on your resume. And of course, coming here we ended up staying this was in 1978 we've been here ever since and it, our lives changed so even though you pay dearly for those agonizing times um, they help you get somewhere somewhere that's going to probably be good for you so hi Thank you. This has been remarkable, Perry and Casey. Excuse me. Excuse me. So, <coughs> I'm Loretta Newman. I've been a longtime member of West, and I never heard of this inner voice critic um, until I took a course here at West with Lynn Wayman. Uh, Lynn and Todd now have left, but um, and live far away. Um, but she taught this wonderful course, and she was to talk about the inner critic. And I, I mean, I knew I heard this thing in the back of my head, but I, you know, things I heard, but they weren't all negative, and I didn't understand why, what's so bad about this. And then once in a while I would, but she said, don't think of it as a critic. Think of it as a coach. It's telling you things that you ought to know and that maybe can help you. So I did. And I don't know when it happened, but a few years ago, it totally went away. I wasn't feeling bad or good. I was just having thoughts, but they weren't aimed at me. And I do think it makes a huge difference if you can take that out of that and think about other people or other events, that sort of thing. What is this, the chorus? No. <laughs> Okay, you three, do the chorus and get over it. <laughs> um, I'm Laura, she, hers. Perry and Jeff. It takes this community to find out how much we all have in common. 
honestly. So Jeff, I was born at four pounds, nine ounces. I wasn't premature, I was two weeks late, but I was put in an incubator. And your description of it turns my heart upside down. So my parents didn't come to get me. My parents weren't allowed to come and touch me or see me or hold me for three days. It wasn't, wasn't six months, it was three days. But that did the same thing to me that it did to each of you. Abandonment is a huge issue. Neglect is a huge issue that we carry in our bodies from the time we're born. So I was, many of you know I was a therapist and I worked with babies and their families and young children. And that's where I learned a lot of this. The second thing is, I am so jealous. I listened to Michael Pollan read his book. Spring Grove is five minutes up the street from me. Hopkins is 25 minutes away from me. This is where the psilocybin experiments have been going on for decades. And I didn't even know it. I want to do that. You'll tell me how, right? Hi, um, this is Roberta Geyer. Um, well, this is for Laura uh, Scuglio, right? And um, with mistakes, you have to love your mistakes. And especially if you're a creative person, you look for these mistakes because that finds another path. So love your mistakes. Okay, we're gonna head back and see if there's anything more in the chat. Catching up, there's that. Um, Laura DeShula says thank you to Roberta. And Judy Meyer says, I like the idea of taking the judgment out of the voice, neither good nor bad, just thoughts. So thanks to everyone who has shared their reactions to the platform. And just as we share our thoughts and feelings, we also share our resources in this community. And uh, each week we share part of our Sunday collection with an organization who shares our values. And so we give part to our operating budget and part dedicated to a, a fund for justice and compassion. And during the month of March, we are pleased to support the Washington Interfaith Network's climate justice campaign. So WIN was founded in 1996, and it's a broad-based, multiracial, multi-faith, strictly nonpartisan, district-wide, citizens' power organization rooted in local congregations and associations. WIN is committed to training and developing neighborhood leaders, <clears throat> addressing community issues, and holding elected and corporate officials accountable in Washington, D.C. This includes fair wage green jobs, electrified public and affordable housing, ceasing the district's reliance on methane gas, and building a coalition of DC residents at the forefront of change. So let's all take a moment to prepare to respond to the invitation to generosity as we are able. To donate online through the Breeze system, go to tiny.cc westgives, or click on give on our website, ethicalsociety.org. To donate in person, just place cash or check in the basket at the back of the hall on your way out, and you can always send a check by mail. Thank you for your generosity. We will now receive your gifts and the gift of music.
Thank you so much to the many people who helped to create this morning's time together. Certainly our platform speakers, Casey Slack and Perry Bider, um, and musicians of the West Course, and a surprise appearance by Leah Morris. Staff members and Dara Miles, Robin Kravitz, and Maceo Thomas, and of course our platform production volunteers, the tech team members, slide artists, Zoom chat usher, and in-person greeters, whose names you'll see on the final slide. And others are eagerly invited to join in these teams, so chat with one of the team members to learn more. Training is provided, so no prior skills are required. I want to mention a few things upcoming in the life of our community. First is to take note that next Sunday, March 31st, uh, the AEU is offering an All Societies platform at 11 a.m., 11 a.m., and I believe that we are not actually going to have anybody here at West, so don't come here. Just log in virtually from home or wherever you happen to be. And complete information will be available on the AEU website, which is www.aeu.org. And I'm sure there'll be information in the news and notes this week about that as well. We are seeking volunteers to help plan our Spring Festival and Founders Day celebration. So if you're interested in helping plan the Spring Festival for April 28th, please email to KC. And if you want to help with Founders Day preparations, which are in May, please talk with Julie Drizzen. We encourage you to get the West Breeze app. It gives access to the membership directory, the West calendar of events, links to make donations, and other important information. If you need help getting set up, there's gonna be a Breeze help desk in the lobby following platform to assist. West visitors and friends, starting today after platform, Wes will be offering our Path to Membership series for anyone who's interested in joining or simply learning more. We'll learn more about Wes and our history, the national organizations we're affiliated with, how Wes governs itself, and what exactly membership means. This is today's meeting is the first in a series of three, which ends in the new member celebration during Spring Festival on April 28th. So the other dates are April 14th and 21st, but if you can't attend all of them, just let us know. Don't need to, you know, we can work around that. That'll be all great. After platform today, the Community Relations Committee and Lifelong Learning will present the next session of the Creating a Caring Culture series in the social hall at 12.30 to 2. And Vivek Shashandra and Joe London will lead an exploration of the urgency within us that causes unrealistic expectations and how we can replace it with more compassionate practices. A nice follow on to our topic this morning. Um, on Monday, April 1st, no fooling, at 7 via Zoom, join the West Board of Trustees for the second virtual town hall. They'll provide an update on West's finances. Uh, the meeting is open to all members and a chance to ask the board your questions and share ideas about how this year is going so far, what's going well, things you're concerned about, what's the next thing we ought to do. You can send questions ahead of time by emailing, and the name is email to board at ethicalsociety.org, and the Zoom link is in the News and Notes weekly email. And finally, I invite Jeff Mehal to share a special message. And Jeff, if you want to step to that mic there. Um, let me help you turn that on. Hello? OK. I appreciate. Uh, Casey and Karen um, helping me with this. This is an announcement I hope I would never have had to make. Uh, recent events have shown that the person with whom I'm sharing a house, we really can't cohabitate under the same roof any longer. I do not have the financial resources to live independently in the Washington area. So over the next several months, I'm going to prepare and pack up and leave the area. And I'll go live with my mother in St. Petersburg, Florida. I really don't want to go. You know, I thought I'd get through this without crying, and it's not going to happen. How do I sum up 31 years of being a member of a wonderful community like Wes? Uh, there's just so much. 
and I've learned so much, and I've changed so much. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, so just bear with me over the next couple of months, and I'll make a pro forma declaration to the pastoral care team. Um, I'm going to need your help. Um, this is a change for me. But I'm not going into the chrysalis. I feel like I'm going back into the goo. Um, now that having been said, I'll still be a member here. Don't, don't throw away this name tag just yet. I'm going to be in touch with several people. You'll hear from me. Believe me, you will. Um, I, I look forward to hearing from you too. Let, you know, drop me a line. You can call me, I'll give you the number. I don't have an internet connection at my mom, so that's the real problem. Um, I'll look forward to getting the, the, even getting the invoices for the pledge. Could drop in occasionally if somebody was, would be willing to put up with me or put me up for a day or two. Um, and finally, I'm going to bet that when Stone Soup comes around, there'll be a certain mystery chef that makes an appearance. Thank you very much for letting me be a part of this community. Well, that's it for announcements today. As always, you can find information about opportunities to connect in the weekly news and notes email and on the calendar page of Wes's website, ethicalsociety.org. Again, if you are new to our community, please introduce yourself in person or via the connection form at tiny.cc slash westconnects or an email to Wes at ethicalsociety.org. At the conclusion of platform, please join us for social hour, either here or on Zoom at tiny.cc slash westcoffeehour. I now invite you to join in our closing sing-along and closing words. Perry. So we don't... So we don't
And now for our closing words, let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding, and commitment, working for climate justice and honoring growth and change within ourselves. Thank you all for joining today's platform in person and remotely. We look forward to connecting with you again soon. Have a great week.